fidgety, skeptical newsman who had a panic attack live on Good Morning America. To prescribe statins slowly for cancer production. That led me to something I always thought was ridiculous, meditation. I wrote a book about it, launched an app, and now I'm starting this podcast to try to figure out if there's anything beyond 10%. Basically, here's what I'm obsessed with. Can you be an ambitious person who is nonetheless striving for enlightenment, whatever that means? Let's start the show. All right, well, thank you for doing this. Really yeah, appreciate it. Me. Yeah. Uh, so I always start with the same question, which is how did you start meditating and why? Um, well, you know, I um, what happened was, <laughs> and this is the kind of longer story. We have plenty I, of time. I, I Go was, for the longer. I, my girlfriend in my 20s, who I dated for years, um, I thought she had an anxiety problem. And she would also agree that she had a problem with anxiety. And one day I said, you need to meditate. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get you meditating. And then she didn't, and we broke up. She's lovely, and we're still friends. This is not a, a, a you know, <laughs> slam against her. Is she still anxious? I don't think she's as anxious, <laughs> but I don't even know if she meditates. I don't, I don't know. So the major but, variable may be that she's no longer with you. Well, no, I, maybe I was the cause of the anxiety. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I, I, I then um, was really hit hard by this breakup, and um, and – it turned out I was the one who needed to meditate. I, you know how we, we, we engage in a lot of projection as human beings, and it turned out that I was deeply in need of meditation myself. And I, uh, you know, um, I think living in the modern world is uh, an assault on your senses on, 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 in many ways, and it only seems to be getting worse, it's, it, if that's what it feels like to me anyway. And so I think in 2004, maybe the, the spring of 2004, I learned um vedic meditation which is essentially tm um and it's the same same practice but i learned uh from someone um who was very close to the maharishi mahesh yogi and um it was just you know there was a lovely community in la at that time who was all learning from him and he had trained a number of teachers so there was a nice community out there and i just started you know uh, twice daily meditation which uh i really haven't stopped i mean i i still struggle to get the second one in. I don't know what kind of... Med- do you do TM? Is that what you I do? I do mindfulness. Oh, mindfulness. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I generally, most mornings, will meditate first thing. You know, I still do it. I sometimes will get the second one in. I try to get the second one in, but... Um, uh, and my meditation practice has changed. I mean, I've experimented with different forms of it, but since 2004, I've never really stopped meditating. And, you know, meditation is one of those subtle things where you say, is it working? And you kind of, it's hard to say. My, my teacher used to say, drop your consciousness, na- drop your old consciousness into your new body, and it would go crazy. Like, your body wouldn't be able to hold it. Like, you, the benefits of meditation are so subtle, and they just, um, they just reveal themselves in a very subtle way. So I think, you know, I look back, my life is very different than it was in 2004. It's a lot bigger. It's, you know, my career took off in different ways. So I have to give a lot of credit to meditation. I don't think it, I don't know that I, maybe the things would have happened, but I don't know that I would have processed them in as sane a way if I wasn't, if I didn't have a meditation practice, you know? Okay, so you said a million things that I want to follow up Okay, there. sure. Um, yeah. Uh, just to set myself, just in my, in my mind, in the chronology of your life here, 2004, so that's before How I Met Your Brother? Yeah. So, I think I did the pilot of How I Met Your Mother in 2006, maybe? 2005 or so, six. So at that point, were you kind of a, uh, an aspiring actor? Had you done much? No, I had been, I had starred on Broadway in The Graduate. I had done a couple pilots and series that, that you know, d- didn't work for a number of reasons. You know, either I was replaced, they were canceled. Uh, you know, I did a pilot with Rob Reiner for NBC that didn't go, you know. And so I think How I Met Your Mother was my fourth pilot I had done. And um, so I was a working actor. I was probably someone that, like, casting directors and, and TV executives would know, but the average person in the on the street would have no idea who I was. So was you that know? a kind of an angsty stage in your life? And you know, was it was, but in it? some ways it was. It, there was a sweetness to it because it's something I talked about in my movie Liberal Arts that I wrote and directed was this notion that, you know, when you get out of college or school that it's just infinite possibility, like everything's in front of you. And there's a sweetness to that that uh, sense of possibility whereas when something happens like a how i met your mother or you know that first big job that really introduces you to a lot of people your whole career on some level has to be a response to that mm-hmm. because 
it's always going to be a part of your you, things get narrower, but they also get more exciting in a weird way, like because things are actually happening. Mm-hmm. But it also it feels constricting in some ways. So I think my meditation practice through that ended up being really beneficial to me because I um, I had to, um, you know, I think anyone who achieves some sort of public um, exposure or renown, um, there's always a, a point where you go a little crazy because you don't know you're being looked at in a different way and you're, uh, you know, you feel like you're being showered in blessing and you also get a little scared to leave your apartment. You, you know, all at the same time, it, it can be very unnerving to um, to taste fame for the first time. Yeah, I mean, very few people ever get to experience that. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of people just say they want it without thinking it through. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, had, I, I, had you thought it through? Not quite. And I don't know that you can. I mean, I certainly wanted... Um, a certain amount of visible success you want as an actor so you can keep doing bigger and better things, you know? I think I think it would be a really great gig if you could have all the work and none of the fame. Mm. I think that would be, like, the sweet spot. So but none of the fame is... I mean, none of the fame is gratifying? Is it? Is, it's not not, cool not exactly none of the fame. I mean, look, it's nice to get a table, and it's nice to have some people come up and just in the middle of your day and tell you how much your work has affected them. That's all very sweet. But there's other things about it that um, you have to contend with that are, you know, when you don't want it, you know, you can't quite turn it. It's not up to you when it's, you can't turn it on or off. And I'm not, you know, I don't deal with, um, you know, uh, I, I can still live a life. Like I, I, I've, I've found a way to live a life that feels manageable. And sometimes it, you know, in L.A., they basically leave you alone because that, that's and where in New York City. Like, on some level, I, although there's a lot of students and tourists yeah, here, and the students true. and tourists love, you know, <laughs> the show. And, um, but then, you know, you realize you're connecting with people, and, and you do you do want some of, um, you know, it's a visible, I'm putting myself out there. It might be part of my, I, you know, I'm a little more attracted to writing and directing now just because it feels less, I mean, it feels like I can still be endlessly creative without all the kind of, exposure of my face <laughs> right know? right but um well it sounds like you have a managed ego then because a lot of people really care a lot about the exposure of their face yeah but i i, I think that there's a part of me that's actually shy i don't know if it's ego or 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 what um i, I still have one and i'm working on it. <laughs> you know it's not like i'm immune from the temptations of it but i've tried to, i've tried post how i met your mother to to make decisions that were not based in some sort of desperation to stay relevant or, or in front of people. You know, I've gone back to the theater. I've done this show for PBS, you know. Um, Mercy Street. It's called Mercy Street, and it's it's a really good show. Um, but I've, I've kind of thrown myself into ensembles, you know. I haven't been like, yeah, da, 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 you know, look at me. And um, that just feels right to me right now. I don't, I don't know um, if... Uh, if I if I'm not if I don't have a particular kind of narcissism that would allow me to be a little more out there, um, but but I'm I'm a, I, I try to orient my life in a spiritual context, and what I mean by that is, um, did you ever read by the way the David Brooks book the Wo- the Road to Character? No, I'm familiar with it's it. It's excellent. Is it? I really recommend okay. it. Yeah, Duly but noted. he t- he talks about um, these two things that are competing within us, which he calls resume virtues and eulogy virtues <laughs> and he says the resume virtues are like obviously you know what makes you hireable what makes you a, a kind of interesting person at a dinner party yep. and the eulogy virtues are like what will they say about you at your funeral right. was he a good friend was right. he a good parent was he generous charitable kind compassionate forgiving all those things and you know i i can get hijacked by resume virtues certainly i i, I it, it it takes up in a, a lot of space in my head but I ultimately feel like I want to be a person who leans into eulogy virtues more. And I try to remember that, you know, the, the, the kind of deathbed moment of like what kind of person, you know, the, the old, you know, no one wishes they spent more time at the office. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I feel like some gift in, in How I Met Your Mother like freed me up to actually, because it didn't, and I'm really grateful for that show and I love being a part of it, but it didn't give me the kind of sustained euphoria that you think it would. And what people are disappointed to hear that it didn't. You know, mm. they'll say like, what do you mean you weren't endlessly happy for nine <laughs> straight years? And you're like, well, nothing. You can't get out of being human. You can't get out of the like peaks and valleys of being a human being, you know. So I, I, it sent me on this search for, well, what is meaningful? Like, like 
I love doing work, but it's the doing the work. You know, I there were things I did that were really small that have been so meaningful to me. And just a couple of people will see them, but it doesn't matter to me because it it altered me and changed me. And meditation is something that gets me back to being quiet so I can hear that kind of guidance, like, like eulogy virtue guidance versus the, you know, like the ego is just, it's a bully. It's just mm-hmm. gonna scream at you. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one of the ways you can tell that it's the ego is if it's screaming and if there's confusion. Because I feel like the and if it's self-referential and it, yeah, and it's all about yourself. If it's not extending itself beyond your own kind of gratification in every any moment, you know. So, just trying to get to that place, you know, what uh, it's not even my. I'm not. I wasn't raised Christian, but when Jesus says, you know, the kingdom of heaven is within, I think that's what he's referring to. You know that that the answers are actually a friend of mine just told me this great uh, ac- acronym for faith: finding answers in the heart. Mm-hmm. You, you know, like going within and getting quiet like that's where you're actually going to get the true gps the one that'll lead you to like a a more sustainable i don't even know if happiness is the right word but like peace just some equanimity so you're not on the crazy you know roller coaster of the up and down you know i feel i'm always trying to find some sort of equanimity in that regard so tell me about just for the uninitiated tell just describe what vedic meditation is and and I'll start you off a little bit. So yeah. Vedic meditation is, m- mindfulness meditation, which is what I do, is de- derived from Buddhism. And I actually probably, uh, even if I'm going to be more honest, I, I'm probably just a flat out Buddhist because that's mostly what I do. Yeah. Uh, Vedic meditation is is Hindu meditation, uh, mostly with a mantra. Yeah. The most famous variety of that is transcendental meditation, TM, yeah. which was invented by the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Right. It's actually, I don't know that he invented it. He popularized it. Well, I he, mean, it's a, he invented TM. He, yes. yes. He, but he, he patented was, it. He, tra- he literally trademarked, yeah. Yeah. as I understand it, a version of, if not the exact same thing, that had been practiced for 3,000 years. Yeah, which I, I'm i conflicted about uh, patents and trademarks on anything having to do with spirituality because I think it's, uh, a, 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 you know, humanity's gift without, you know, trying to monetize it. But that said, I also... You know, I, I, I think uh, Gurdjieff, who's this great Russian mystic, said um, you have to charge for spiritual instruction because he said we don't value something we haven't paid yeah. for. Eckhart Tolle says the same thing. Yeah, so I think there is something to be said for the exchange of energy. You yeah. know, my teacher, uh, he had who's asked— Who's your teacher? Uh, I, I don't want to say his name because oh, okay, I don't okay. study with him anymore. Okay, but, no, um, no worries. No worries. He, uh, you know, he would ask for a week's earnings, and it was up to you to set what that was. But when, I, when people would ask me, like, what should I pay? And I'd say, you know— think of something and then add a little bit more like it should pinch a little bit yeah just because you if you you know if you give them a hundred bucks you're you might you're not going to sit in the chair every morning but if you give them a thousand bucks you might be more willing to try to get some bang for your buck so i think um i think there's something to be said for that but uh you know uh, mantra literally means mind vehicle and it's a, you know, you get an, uh, a, a mantra that's based on a number of different things, but uh, kind of geared towards you and where you are in your life, I suppose. But it, it means mind vehicle, and, it, and it's just an onomatopoetic word that doesn't have any meaning. So sometimes people who come from heavy, you know, Christian, Jewish backgrounds or whatever, they're like, oh, I don't want to get into this Hindu practice. And it's like, well, it's just a word that settles your mind. That's all it does, and it's the sound that settles your mind. Not there's no meaning to the word. But you're saying the word quiet silently. You're yourself. saying the word with great, uh, with with. Uh, <laughs> it's it's kind of a, a riddle to do it because you're encouraging effortlessness, which is, in some ways, a beautiful thing because it's the antidote to what we're doing in life, which is pure effort all the time. So to close your eyes twenty minutes twice a day, and repeat as effortlessly as you can, which is actually quite difficult because you, how do you say something without effort? Um, But even just the intention to think the mantra is the mantra. Just the intention, the awareness, like Mm. I'm thinking the mantra, the mantra comes, does its own work because it's kind of, and then you get into this phase where the mantra is just kind of doing its own thing. Now, the way I was uh, taught is that thought in meditation is not bad it's just stress release it's just like the dirt coming off you in a shower and there's no you don't need to study the dirt at the bottom of the you know just rinse just just let it go and then um, i like that 
Yeah. Because it, thought is the thing that people get hung up on. They're like, I can't certain, do this. I can't stop thinking. Yeah, yeah. But it's like, uh, well, you can't drive a stick shift car until someone teaches you. I mean, you, you know, certain people say, well, I've tried to meditate and I can't. I said, what, do you, what does that mean? They said, well, I tried to just sit with my eyes closed and, you know, not think. Impossible. It's actually impossible. Mm -hmm. So you really do need some sort of instruction. I mean, the thing I like about the mantra is it's an anchor in the midst of the the dark wood of the mind. <laughs> you know, like like okay, I'm being overrun by thoughts, and then you just come back to the mantra, come back to the mantra, come back to the mantra, and then you forget. And it, you know, the other crazy thing is the mantra is designed so you forget it. It it works at a very subtle, and it's to bring your mind to the kind of s subtlest strata. You know. And into where you become, you know, what they call the simplest form of awareness, where you have no thought, but you're not asleep. <laughs> it's like this really, and you know, when you experience it, it's strange because the time goes by, you haven't said the mantra, but you're not asleep and you haven't had any thought. So this can happen in a 20 minute sit? Certainly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then you come out and you feel, you know, uh, that you've gone somewhere and you've, touch some sort of gold and you come back and you just feel a little more efficient, a little kinder, a little, you know, I'm not, I'm not I think, you know, meditation is, I think that, that there's no accident that meditation and medication are only one letter off. <laughs> and I think, you know, we're really medicated right now. And I think what, what everyone's trying to achieve through the medication and I, and this is not a slam against pharmaceuticals because I think some people might really need them. But I think um, a lot of what we're looking for is just, some sort of relief from the, whether it's self-loathing voices or anx anxiety-producing voices or, um, you know, grievances, like whatever overwhelms mm -hmm. us, whatever is our, our, uh, our thing that just has us by the throat. Um, and there are these ancient practices from many different traditions that recognize this, that said, yeah, the, 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 the greatest, you know, it's like they say the, the mind is a wonderful servant and a terrible master. Like we're, we're, we're enslaved right now to the mind. And now we have this hive mind called the internet, mm. which is, um, we've never seen anything like it. So to, you know, not fall prey to the, 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 the voices and the noise, it feels more urgent to me than ever to stick with this. I fully agree. Yeah. When I'd love to hear just a little bit about how the, rubber hits the road in terms of the meditation being valuable in your life. So just thinking back to when you got this big role on uh, How I Met Your Mother and you were talking earlier about how it didn't make your life a nonstop uh, bliss field. Um, yeah. In fact, you, you couldn't escape, as you I said quite poignantly, from the human condition, even yeah. though you had what you ostensibly wanted. Yeah. Um, how, how was meditation and was meditation useful in that period? Um. And just the ups and downs when you thought you shouldn't be just having agree. it. The, the, this just occurred to me because I remember I watched it the other night. But um, Jim Carrey did something at the Golden Globes last year that I thought was like one of the best things I've ever seen on television where he was introduced as two-time Golden Globe winner Jim Carrey. And he said, yeah, that's right. I'm two-time Golden Globe winner Jim Carrey. And he goes, when, when I go to sleep at night, I don't, I don't dream normal dreams. <laughs> he said, no. I dream about being three-time Golden Globe winner Jim Carrey because then, finally, I would be enough. And I could stop this desperate search for something that won't all, I know ultimately won't make me happy. And it was so bracing to hear someone come into a room where everyone's hungering for these little gold idols, which feels very much like what they said in the Old Testament, like, don't worship that. <laughs> you know, that's not what it is. And everyone's hungering. For, now, look, I'm not going to turn down a Golden Globe if they want to give me one. I'm not saying I'll, I'll protest the ceremony. I'm just saying it was bracing to hear someone come in the room and said, I've won two of these. It didn't solve anything for me, you know. And it's not, it's, it's just, you know, you can feel emptier. One of the things, the reasons people, you know, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are depressed and movie stars try to kill themselves is because on the other side of the velvet rope, is not the thing they told you would be there. I mean, we're we're operating under, you know, a lot of delusions around success and money and all these things. So I think it's actually good on some level, like if you want them, get them to disprove to yourself that that will save you. Then you can go about the real work of like getting quiet. You know, I was actually, um, I, I, I came across this quote from Pascal, uh, Blaise Pascal, is that mm -hmm. I don't know, the mm -hmm. French philosopher, who said, um, 
All of the world's problems stem from man's inability to be quiet in a room by himself. You know? I love that. And I, I tweeted it, and it's funny how some people don't really understand what that means. If you don't understand what that means, you'll think, no, we just need cooperation, or man needs to stop being so stupid. You know, people wrote to me, and I said, no, no, no. It means that what we're talking about. It you means can't get cooperation without the... Without yeah, quiet, yeah. you know? And the the people, I think, who really have been deep change agents in the world, you know, the Mandelas and the Gandhis, and, you know, these were people who were rooted in that place, like absolutely rooted in that still place and negotiated from that place and said no and yes from that place and led people from that place. And um, I just think, uh, you know, your question was about, you know, how how it helped me navigate success in some yeah, ways. Like yeah, like overwhelming success. Well, uh, you know... <sighs> I, one of the things that happens with success is you metabolize it very quickly. So one day you're auditioning for pilots and the next day you're on a t hit TV show and somehow it all feels normal because you just show up for work every day with, you know, other famous people who are your friends and you're just working with them and you're making a show. And I didn't even watch the show that much. Like other people know the show a lot better than I do, you know. So, um, you know, there's a term for what you're describing. What's that? Hedonic adaptation. Oh, is that right? Yes, like it's a version of hedonism. Like yeah. you just when something good happens to you, you so quickly bake it into your baseline yes, yes. that you don't appreciate it anymore. Oh, a hundred percent. And I actually heard this thing that um, the reason time moves so slowly when we're young is because everything's new yes. and we're taking it in for the first yes. time. And when we get older, we're actually not observing the world in a in a, a vital way anymore. Makes sense. And then things just speed up because we're not taking it in. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember so strongly how long a summer felt when you're a kid, how long a year, a school year. And now it's like, you know, things just go. So um, I think I, I think, um, you know, the anchor of waking up meditating or even meditating in my dressing room, when I directed my first film, if they were lighting for 20 minutes, I would grab a 15, 20 minute meditation, just, you know, on a folding chair in the quietest space I could find. Um, and uh, have you read David Lynch's book, uh, yeah, Catching, Catching the, the Big, Big Fish? Fish. Yeah, I, I, it's another book I have not read, but I'm. It's terrific, with it. and yeah. it's totally worth reading. But he, he really thinks that meditation is the, the kind of uh, that's where he digs and gets all that weird stuff. It's the wellspring of creativity yeah. for him. Yeah, yeah. And I, um, I actually, have, I don't do that kind of meditation, but I mean, it, it to me. That's, I get an enormous flood of ideas oh, yeah. the more I meditate. Yeah, m me too. And I, and I also found that I don't work so – a lot of people work really well with a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. Depression or heartbreak is where a lot of their creativity springs from. I am not that person. I, I work much better when I'm connected to – you know that quiet when I'm meditating when I'm praying when I'm um when I just feel like I'm hooked into something larger than myself um Elizabeth Gilbert gave a really brilliant TED talk about creativity how it used to be you know a genius was something outside of you this kind of exogenous entity that you kind of prayed to like all right genius we're going to start writing and then something disastrous happened when we became the genius mm -hmm. like oh i'm a genius <laughs> and she thinks this is really psychologically unhealthy and i agree you know when i can petition to something larger than myself for inspiration and then not ultimately take credit for it that's what the bhagavad gita says you know do the action but the fruits of the labor are not yours and um so when i when i can get quiet and and feel like i'm hooked into that kind of conveyor belt of creativity that is much bigger than me. Um, I, 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 I somehow feel like I'm, I'm going to be okay. I might be okay, you know, and, and reading, reading books that feel nourishing, um, cutting toxic people out of my life. You know, one of the things I got really good at was when you're on TV, you can feel very strongly when people want to hang out with you for the wrong reasons, you know, and I just got my GPS really strong about, sizing people up and what their intentions were and when you meet someone that has never seen your tv show and doesn't know who you are but they're fascinating to talk to you kind of hold on to them for mm -hmm. dear life because mm -hmm. you say like you could be a real friend and i have some deep friends that i was friends with from before the show so i think uh you know i I'd, I'd, I'd like to write maybe an extended piece on 
on and I, and I gave a talk in India about it last year in Mumbai at something called the Inc conference in um which was essentially a spiritual approach to celebrity. You know, how do we how did I navigate like if I didn't want to be a jerk and I didn't want to be a drug addict or an alcoholic and I didn't want to be an agoraphobic weirdo who never left the house like how was I going to deal with this weird aspect of my life, you know? It's what Ram Dass calls, you know, he says whatever your life is that's your yoga. That's your practice, you know? If you're if your mother's sick, that's your yoga. If you're on a hit TV show, that's your yoga. <laughs> you know, if if you're getting evicted or if you're a landlord, like that's your yoga. So um, I just tried to really look at what was in front of me and just say like, okay. And uh, it sounds silly to talk about, you know, being on a hit TV show as being a spiritual struggle, but it was, and it continues to be. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, do you find success to be... It's a complicated thing. It is a complicated thing. Because you also can't yes. complain about it to a lot of people. Yes. <laughs> you know That's what I mean? exactly right. So you, 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 it's isolating. Yeah. You know, there's very few people that want to hear you complain about being... But it's also know. a complicated thing. I mean, I don't... Uh, you know, I, I there are vastly fewer people who are going to come up to me in Times Square than to you. Right. But... Uh, the and for me that's not really where the issue lies personally it's more that um it's what you said about the resume virtues versus um eulogy, the, eulogy virtue. virtues yeah that um once you get some you taste of some success you you have five minutes where like i can't believe this happened yeah. right, I, I wrote this book i didn't think anybody was going to read it yeah. well, people are reading it and then you're like what's my next book going to be why yeah. are more people reading oh it's it? endless and when you, i mean if you go on a a, a, publici- a publicity tour about like a movie you made like i you know I'm like movies of you know i've written directed starred in they've gone to sundance they've won awards i'm out publicizing them and they say so what's up next and i'm like wait, I just, can I have a break? Like, I just did this thing. And then you start going, what's next? You know, like, I remember when I, I, um, I was talking to some, I, well, I signed with a publicist because you, at a certain point, you need a publicist to help you navigate the thickets of publicity, which when I was, wanted to be a theater actor in New York, the idea that I would have a publicist sounded grotesque, but you can't do without one at a certain point. But my first publicist, I said to her, because I'm on a hit TV show now, do I have to try to become a movie star? Like, is that something I have to now try to do? Like, are we, is that what we're all trying to do? And that didn't entirely appeal to me. But I thought, well, what do I do? Like, what am I supposed to do? And if I'm just on a hit TV show and then I, 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 I'm never seen, heard from again, am I going to be like the sad guy who whatever happened to so-and-so? Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So there are, I'm in the, I'm just as much in the grip of that egoic stuff as anyone. But I also, I'm also trying to run the marathon and I know that after you're you have a very visible success I think it's okay to go away for a while or or you know do something quieter for a while and so where where are you with that now I mean, it's been two years since the show yeah I mean I was I was on Broadway last year in a play called Disgrace that was amazing and uh, I filmed two seasons of this show Mercy Street on PBS which has been extraordinary I'm doing a play at Lincoln Center right now I've made a couple of small movies. I made a gorgeous movie with my favorite band called Cloud Cult, which is like this very intensely um, spiritual and awake band from, from Minnesota and Wisconsin. And I'm pretty close with them now. But we did this film called The Seeker that, was, that I helped produce that was um, just an hour long. It goes, it's a silent film that's just scored by their new record. Um, and you know, it was an extraordinary experience and really small, like maybe just for cloud called fans. I don't know. <laughs> it's going to, you know, they're going to do a couple of tug screenings and, um, people will see it and you'll be able to get it. But, um, you know, things that just meant something to me, like someone asked me about a job I did and I, and I said, I don't know if it changed the world, but it changed me. And, and that's what I'm doing right now is like, what, what opens my heart? Like, what makes me feel like, okay, I can spend two months or six months or a year working on this and feel 100% yes. And so how do you manage, because I imagine it's still there, the little screaming voice that says, oh, well, you know, what's your next big, quote unquote, big, you know, yeah. uh, thing? Or, or can, can, you, can you shut that out and just be, because you seem pretty happy with what you're doing right now. So maybe that's just- I mean, the, I am, the, but then, you know, okay, so I've worked- I've worked nonstop since I left. I mean, really, I I, I just haven't stopped working. Um, 
And then, you know, a Brazilian teenager writes you on Twitter and says, hey, man, when are you going to do something again? Oh, you, you know what I mean? Because they're not watching PBS. <laughs> you know, they're not watching PBS. They're right. not they're not right. coming to Lincoln Center to see right. your play. So they think you just went away. And so you, you know, you don't want to be led by the Brazilian teenager voice in your head, no. which nothing against Brazilian teenagers. No. They're lovely. But, um, you know, there's a um, y- you've got to negotiate, you know, what what's bringing you some sense of fulfillment i mean the sweet spot would be something that is i talk my friend ben lee and i wrote a uh, this is another thing i did we i wrote an album with my friend ben lee who's an australian singer songwriter and we're you know finishing it up right now do you we, play in- no no no, no okay. i just sing and write songs with him he plays guitar and, but you can sing yeah oh right you're on broadway okay yeah. yes, yes but uh he um uh we we the, one of the first talks we had, and we actually met on the set of How I Met Your Mother because they used a song of his, and he liked the show and wanted to come by, and we we became friends. And weirdly, um, I ran into him when I was waiting to see my meditation teacher, and he was living across the street from where he was teaching. And he said, "What are you doing here?" I said, "I'm meeting my meditation teacher." And he asked who it was. I told him. He said, "He taught me to meditate in Australia when I was 19." So we had learned from meditation from the same <laughs> teacher. It was so weird. But um, I, uh, you know, one of our first talks we had was. How do you be both good and popular? Like, what do you, you know, like, there's that feeling of like, okay, either I'm a sellout making Drek and lots of people watch it, or I do something good that no one sees. And I don't, I'm not, I don't really subscribe to that because I think there's quality things out there that people watch. And I think that people do know the difference of quality. And, you know, look, there's still a lot of terrible things that a lot of people watch, but there's also a lot of good things that people watch. So I, I want to be, I want to make good things. You know, and I and I I want to contribute something valuable to the atmosphere because I feel there's a lot of toxicity out there. There's a lot of noise, and I feel like if I could make something that was informed by my eulogy virtues, by my spirituality, by my centeredness, I feel like that translates, that jumps out of the screen at people, and people say, "Oh, I felt altered by this, or this felt different than something." I didn't feel like I was being screamed at, but in that way. I, some of the work I've done, you know, like this beautiful film with Cloud Cult, The Seeker, that's a film that whispers. That's not a film that'll scream and grab you by the lapels. That's a, that's a film you got to lean into. You got to seek it out, mm. you know? So, you know, I wish I had a billion dollars and a distribution arm and I could just, you know, advertise on buses of everything I want and care about. But um, I'm still, I, you know, another thing is, and this is why I love this play, I'm doing the Babylon line right now. It, it's about two people who think they're in the, at the end of their story. They think they're in a tragedy, but it's revealed they're actually in just in the middle of their story. And I think one of the things that our mind does is it makes us think we're always at the end, but really you're just in a middle chapter mm-hmm. of your story. So who knows? I mean, I, 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 How I Met Your Mother might be my great popular success. I mean, it might be. I, I hope it's not. I suspect I'll ha- I have some other things that will get seen and noticed. And I'm just going to keep making things that light me up, you know, because I, I think I have good taste. I mean, that's the only thing I have to go on, really. I, uh, I think, that, I mean, just I'm not your manager or your advisor. Just you want to be? Who, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, mm-hmm. you, 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 I'd be worth what you'd be paying me, which would be zero. Mm-hmm. Um, I, but as somebody who just met you and already likes you, I would say that's the right strategy. Like, what else? What other choice do you have? You just, do, you're in a privileged position. You were on this hit show, which means that you don't have to, like, uh, work every second of every day to yeah. survive and so just do the stuff you love and hope that uh, and then don't worry about it in some level yeah and i think I, you know it's funny the um the filmmakers who like woody allen or the cohen brothers i remember the cohen brothers were so mystified that true grit was this like crazy hit they they didn't understand why why that and not any of their other films and Raising Arizona is a pretty big hit, right? Yeah, but I th- I don't think they'd had as big a you know like a hundred million dollar yeah, hit. Yeah, I don't yeah, think they'd yeah, had that. No. Maybe not ever. I think it was. I think True Grit was their highest grossing film, and so great movie. It's a great movie, you know. But I think that they're, um, you know, like Woody Allen. He didn't know why Midnight in Paris. Hit. He thought his greatest comedy was Hollywood Ending. Like yeah. I think there's something about people who just keep making films or keep going that really appeals to me, and like. Like Krishna says to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, like the fruits of the labor, that has nothing to do with you. Correct. Make it. That was my point. Just keep making it. Yeah. So I'm just going to keep making stuff and I feel like I'll be surprised and then I'll be disappointed and then I'll be surprised again. 
and none of it matters. What I'm really interested in having is a body of work that I can look back on and say, I stand by all these choices. I know why I did these. I feel good about the reasons I did these, and I feel good about the final product. You know? What would you say to a young, let's just say actor, but it could be anybody who's young, up and coming, super ambitious, wants to make his or her mark. Yeah. What would your advice be? Honestly, and yeah. I'm not saying this because I'm on this podcast, I, I always tell people get a meditation practice. Because I think that, you know, the only advice I have to give is like, be raised by Carol and Alan Radner in this town, go to these <laughs> schools, and then get this agent, and then do these jobs. Like, I only have my own biography, you know, to reference. And it was a very particular thing that brought me, you know, where it brought me. But everyone else's path is going to be so particular. And I think that getting quiet, you know, for some time during the day, especially in the midst of this noise we've been talking about, both internal, you know, individually and collectively, there's just a lot of noise. Um, you'll be able to hear the guidance. You know, one of the things I think meditation does is it um, it strengthens your instinct. It strengthens your um, ability to kind of size people up quickly. You know, you can uh, you can read, uh, like I said, that 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 kind of vampiric energy coming from people. Mm -hmm. And you go, you know what? I'm going to back away from this. This doesn't feel safe and healthy to me. And then there are other people that you think, no, this feels good. I like, I like what they're about. I like what they're saying. So um, you've got to make a lot of snap, quick judgments in in this industry that I'm in. You know about who you're going to collaborate with. So I think, um, you know, also breathing. You know, just the basics. Like we we, we lose ourselves, and I think. Um, if you're so focused on the next thing, you're not really paying attention to the opportunities that are actually are coming your way. And um, so I think I think getting a meditation practice and, and um, um, finding a way to be creative every day. Like I tell actors, if you can write and you're not writing, it's like a dereliction of duty. Like look at how many people are creating their own work right now and what that's doing for them, you know? Um, I think... Uh, also, you know yourself better than other people. You know how to write for yourself better than other people. You know what talents are not being exploited and paid attention to. So exploit them yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the right word, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Bef before we go, can you just tell us more about the the play you're in right now? Yeah. It's called The Babylon Line. It's at Lincoln Center right now in the Mitzi Newhouse, just a couple blocks from here. Um, it's a play by Richard Greenberg, who's a terrific Tony Award winning writer. He wrote Take Me Out. Um, among another uh, uh, other beautiful plays, and it's about I play a, a blocked, um, poor writer in the '60s living in the village. Who, to make a couple extra bucks, he takes the train to Levittown, Long Island, to teach these Jewish housewives creative writing once a week. And there's a married woman in the class who is complicated but wildly talented and my character I'm also married so we we have it's it's kind of about an emotional affair that never gets never gets consummated but it's also about writing and time and nostalgia and loss and um, perspective and it's a really beautiful rich play it's like a full meal of a play <laughs> it's it's a lot it's very it's very dense and language heavy so if that's your thing you, you know like if you really like words and ideas expressed beautifully and people struggling to find the right words for things you know this is all stuff that really excites me terry kinney directed it who's an amazing actor but also one of the founders of steppenwolf theater in chicago and um the cast is amazing and um yeah it's just it was a great way to come back to new york and um be in a play that felt um you know it it it's a play I never could have written because it's so singular, the voice, but the themes of it are, are really resonate with me. And, and, and I just thought this is something would be great to lend myself to. And how long will it run? Till January 22nd. We've been up for a little while, Excellent. but it's running now. And yeah. I, I, people, we talked about some of the, uh, the, the things you're working on right now, but um, I, I think people after listening to this are probably going to want to learn more about you and consume some of the sure. stuff you've done. So yeah, yeah. You, what, 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 else, what else should we go watch? Well, I wrote and directed two films, um, both of which were premiered at Sundance before being in theaters. The first one was called Happy Thank You More, Please. Um, 
I don't, it's not streaming anywhere right now, but you can get it on iTunes. And then the second film is called Liberal Arts, um, which I was in with Lizzie Olson and Richard Jenkins and Allison Janney and Zac Efron and John Magaro. It's a great, great group. And um, that is streaming on Netflix, as far as I know. That's still streaming. You can also pick it up on iTunes. Um, oh, I have a newsletter. I'm doing like a monthly newsletter. If you go to um, my Twitter page, you can just look at, you know. And What's your I, handle? Uh, Josh Radner. Okay. Yeah. And so I'm doing like a monthly thing where I just recommend things that are, and I do a little essay, you know, I I call it the muse letter. I actually, the followers named it, not me, but I (laughs) like the name. Um, The Seeker might be available on Cloud Cult's website, but there's going to be a couple of screenings around the country coming up in the new year. Um, uh, There's a great film called Afternoon Delight that Jill Soloway directed who created Transparent. That's her first film. I'm in that. Is that out now? Yeah, you can get that somewhere. Um, and, uh, I, I just shot a film in Austin that's, that'll be hopefully, you know, hitting some festivals and, um, and yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm mostly, you know, if people want to learn about me, I, I, you know, subscribe to the newsletter and, and, and also, you know, check in with my films. I also have, you know, essays I've published various places and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to get a website where I can collect all my writings and everything. I wrote a play that I'm hoping to get done soon. So I'm always working on stuff. You're a fascinating dude. Really appreciate you coming in. Yeah, it was good this. talking to you. Really Thanks fun. for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm glad you're bringing meditation to people. This is so great. Thanks. Such a good thing Thanks. to do. Yeah. 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 I, I, I always think like, you know, given the madness of what's going on, it all feels so crazy. And, and it, you know, you almost feel like your impulse is like, contribute to the noise you know get louder Mm -hmm. but i actually feel like no no no, we got to get quieter like then we'll figure out what to do there the solution lies there possibly so i have a friend from the colbert show who says that we my slogan should be getting loud about being quiet (laughs) yeah i like it (laughs) i I like it i do too yeah thank you buddy appreciate it yeah yeah good to be here